Hello, everybody. Good afternoon and welcome once again to our weekly media briefing and public health update. And today joining us is Chief Administrative Officer Rich Madalino from Montgomery County Government, as well as Dr. James Bridgers, who is the Director of the Department of Health and Human Services, and Mr. Sean O'Donnell, Program Administrator, Public Health Emergency Preparedness and Response, also for the Department of Health and Human Services. I'm Laura Navagilli, Hispanic Public Information Officer, and joining us today, we have a very special guest, Terry Lavoie, and she's Assistant Chief of Staff for Walter Reed National Military Medical Center. With that, I toss to you, Mr. Madalino. Good afternoon. Thank you, Lorna. Good afternoon. Thank you, Lorna. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, once again, the County Executive is uh, on a trade mission um, in Asia right now. He is in Vietnam currently. Uh, he uh, spent last week in India where, um, as probably everyone knows, Montgomery County is a global center of excellence in the life sciences. And we're gonna be talking to one of our premier medical institutions today. Um, we're a global center of excellence in hospitality, but we're also um, a growing destination for US headquarters of foreign companies. The county executive is abroad trying to attract businesses to relocate or to move their U.S. headquarters here to Montgomery County, as well as opening the doors for Montgomery County businesses to um, new and large and growing markets in both India and Vietnam. He will be back with us next week um, for the next media briefing. Of course, Saturday is Veterans Day, November 11th, and we wanted to spend some time talking about the veterans um, in our community, as well as the um, uh, amazing uh, federal facilities that are uh, called Montgomery County Home to talk about what they are doing for, for veterans. There are going to be um, four different ceremonies across the county to celebrate our veterans and salute them on Saturday at the Rockville Senior Center, at the Gaithersburg City Hall, at the Veterans Park in Bethesda, and the Wheaton Veterans Park. Each start at 11 a.m., except for the Bethesda ceremony that starts at 11, excuse me, at 10.45. Of course, Veterans Day marks the end of World War I, which concluded on um, the 11th day of the 11th month at the 11th hour, at the 11th minute. So that's why 11, 11, 11 is so important for Veterans Day. Um, and we are proud to have so many different groups saluting and recognizing the, the sacrifices commitment um, of veterans for both their military service and what they've done for our community since they returned home. Um, before we get to um, Ms. Lavoy, I wanted to congratulate the various winners on uh, election day yesterday. Um, we had municipal elections in the city of Rockville and the city of Gaithersburg. Um, it shows that um, in Rockville, former council member uh, Monique Ashton appears to have been elected mayor. Um, the county executive and I um, would like to congratulate uh, Mayor-elect Ashton for her victory and we look forward to continuing to work with her in this new role. Um, she's been a great partner with us on so many different issues. Um, and of course, many of us spend most of our days here in Rockville, so the Rockville city election is so important. We also wanna thank Mayor Bridget Newton for many years of service. It's quite a change, um, you know, after so many years with Mayor Newton, um, and we will certainly um, look forward to working with Mayor-elect Ashton, as well as, um, uh, the first ever six member city council um, in Rockville with five new members. Um, Gaithersburg also selected three new um, town council members. Um, so we look forward to working with all of them. And of course, we say congratulations to all those state and local officials in Virginia that, who won their elections. Um, the county executive values greatly the relationship with those um, local government leaders. Uh, uh, especially Chairman McKay in Fairfax County um, through his work in the Council of Governments and on so many other issues. So uh, we uh, wish everyone um, who won congratulations. And of course, as someone who's won elections and lost elections, um, a thank you and congratulations for putting your name out there and being part of the democratic process. I think we will hear uh, from many, many veterans that one of the reasons why they served was to protect um, American values and American democracy. And of course, voting is um, so important. Um, next year, we will have a presidential primary in Maryland on May 14th. So if you're not already 
already registered to vote, make sure you do that um, because you have to be a registered Democrat or Republican to vote in the primaries. Maryland closed primaries. You got to be a member of one party or the other in order to take part in um, the presidential and so many of the other primary elections. I uh, want to remind everyone, Thanksgiving Day Parade is only 10 days away. Saturday, November 18th, it'll kick off at 10 a.m., rain or shine. It's a great parade. We often have great weather. Oh, you can see the county executive leading the parade um, from a prior year. It is the only Thanksgiving Day Parade in the D.C. region. It's wonderful to come out to Silver Spring, to see everyone, to see the bands, to have a good time with friends and family, and to go shopping. So we're, we're thrilled to have the parade on, um, uh, again, November 18th. And if you want to volunteer, it's not too late to sign up. Now, let's move on back to um, veterans. Uh, Montgomery County is home to one of the nation's largest and highly regarded medical centers for the military community. I mean, I'm sure um, Ms. Lavoie would, would uh, agree it's, it's not just a highly regarded, it is the premier military medical facility in the, in the world. And we are thrilled that it is in Bethesda um, and has been for, um, I believe, more than 80 years. Uh, many people know the, the structure that you see on um, Brackville Pike, Wisconsin Avenue, where they, they join together at 355. Walter Reed is the flagship of a system responsible for caring for 9.6 million people across the globe in the United States military. It is the hospital for presidents, for war heroes, and everyone else tied to the military. Uh, Montgomery County welcomed uh, Walter Reed Army Medical when it was combined with the National Naval Medical Center. Many of us who have spent decades living in this community still want to call it Bethesda Naval. Um, maybe even uh, Miss Lavoy, who spent, I think, time in the United States Navy, still would like to refer to it as Bethesda Naval. But um, it is officially the, Wash the Walter Reed National Military Medical Center. So um, it serves more than one million active military family members and veterans yearly. People come from around the globe, family members from around the globe, um, to be with their loved ones as they get treatment. It is home to many of the Department of Defense's advanced medical research projects. It is a critical partner in Montgomery County. Not only is it a valuable resource for the 30,000 veterans who live in Montgomery County, it provides more than 7,000 jobs in our community and countless other spillover effects as people come um, and spend time in local hotels, spend time in the restaurants uh, around the county. So um, we are very fortunate to have to have it here and quite proud to have Walter Reed in our county. Um, now it is time to officially bring on Terry Lavoy, the Assistant Chief of Staff at Walter Reed. She has been at um, the Medical Center since 1996. She went from an active duty um, status where and retired as a commander to a civilian role continuing at the hospital complex. She has a unique perspective on understanding the dilemmas on both the military side and outside. And so um, considering we are so fortunate to have the Walter Reed National Military Medical Center here, um, as well as other federal um, military medical assets, uh, the United States, I think, uniformed military medical school um, is, is right there adjoining the, um, the, the the both the Walter Reed campus and the National Institutes of Health campus. So um, with that, uh, we want to thank uh, Commander Lavoie for her service and um, ask her to, um, to, to talk a little bit about Walter Reed and the importance of providing medical care to active duty and veterans in our community. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to extend a thank you on behalf of the director of Walter Reed, U.S. Navy Captain Melissa Austin, for hosting us and giving us this opportunity. I'm Terry Lavoie, the Assistant Chief of Staff of Walter Reed National Military Medical Center. We're gathered virtually to, to discuss a mission that remains close to the heart of Walter Reed, 
the unwavering commitment to our military and veterans, and the deep ties we nurture within our community. Walter Reed has long been a symbol of hope and healing, a place where the valor of our service men and women meets the dedication and expertise of some of the nation's finest medical professionals. It's here that the sacrifices of our military personnel are met with the best care our country can offer and where their recovery is a testament to the resiliency of the human spirit. Our gathering today is not just to share updates, but also to reinforce the bridge of support between the hospital and the community it serves. Our military and veterans do not serve alone and neither do they heal alone. Walter Reed is more than a medical facility. It's a community partner dedicated to ensuring those who defend our country receive the support they need both on and off the battlefield. Through community engagement initiatives, outreach programs, and an open dialogue with local organizations and media, we aim to continue a robust support system. This synergy is vital. It ensures our heroes and their families have access to resources, care, and the community. As we move forward, the narratives of courage and service will be matched with stories of communal support and recovery. The assistance provided by Walter Reed is not just medical, it's holistic, encompassing the emotional, psychological, and social aspects of rehabilitation and reintegration. Once again, thank you for your participation today. Your role in conveying these efforts to the wider public is invaluable. I hope together we can continue to honor the service of our military members by ensuring their sacrifices are recognized and their needs are met with the full support of the Walter Reed community. I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you, Ms. Lovell. Members of the media, we're going to open it up now for Q&A. Please raise um, your hands if you have any questions regarding this topic for uh, Ms. Lavoy. Any questions? Members of the media? I do not see any hands up for questions. I do see Rich Maddalino talking, Rich. Uh, so, thank you. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry about that. So, um, the, we have two different mute buttons, and, and they, were, they were both on. I'm sorry about that. So, um, Ms. LaVoy, one of the things you mentioned in your comments was about um, uh, the holistic approach to care. And people may not realize that, you know, for example, um, I was familiar with a, uh, a creative writing journal that comes out um, by, by um, written by some of the, uh, the military personnel who are, who are going under treatment, that you work um, with local artists, local writers to, to help people get better and to recognize that, especially when you're trying to help uh, heal the, some of the mental wounds from injuries and from service, that artistic expression is so important to help people process um, their their injuries. So it it really is, and I don't know if the, the, the public and the media recognizes, there really is that effort to heal, obviously the body, but the, the mind and the spirit. And that's I mean, one of the reasons why the, the level of care is, is so thoughtful and important at Walter Reed. Yeah, thank you. Um, we absolutely do connect with the community and in the arts arena is a great example of how we help our wounded warriors process some of those very tragic events they experience. Um, we have a group that does mask making. We have um, individuals that teach our wounded warriors how to paint and express those psychological challenges. And then we display those around the medical center um, and those develop into conversations that, again, help our wounded warriors to heal. We also um, connect with the community through military service organizations and veteran service organizations who donate things like um, Friday night dinners. We have a donor that donates Friday night dinners to our wounded warriors that stay here 
um, on the installation as well as throughout M Montgomery County. And that helps our warriors to integrate just by uh, going into a restaurant with their family members, sometimes for the first time and interacting with others. So thank you. Um, and thank you. And um, again, the the work that, that happens there, um, the, the service to our community um, is so important. And I know last week, one of the topics of this media briefing with our local um, police chief, Marcus Jones, was about um, the injury, the traumatic injury that one of our um, police officers received um, where uh, in an effort to, um, to try to uh, deal with a radically driving dr uh, motorist, he wound up um, losing both of his legs. Um, and is currently recuperating in, at shock trauma in Baltimore and doing and doing quite well for the traumatic injury he's had. But it's our understanding that, in fact, Walter Reed has already reached out to him and his family about um, coming there because probably no medical institution in the world has the level of experience with helping people um, deal with uh, artificial limbs. And just having Walter Reed here to be able to reach out to that family and help make sure that Sergeant Pat Kep gets back up on um, his legs and back into service, we, we very much appreciate and look forward to um, working, having him work with you and the world-class staff there to help him continue to recuperate. Yeah, and we are thrilled to help others. Um, the expertise that we've honed during this very long war, I think has clearly made us experts in rehabilitation care and in limb loss. And um, if we can help those outside of our installation, outside of our hospital, I think that's a win for both the community as well as for Walter Reed. All right. Um, well, Lorna, I don't, I don't think we're seeing any raised hands. No, we're not. But uh, so let me let me say thank you again um, to Terry Lavoy for joining us, the Assistant Chief of Staff at the Walter Reed National Military Medical Center, and to thank you for your service to this country as a veteran, and to everybody um, who is a, a veteran. Thank we, you for the opportunity, sir. We do see a hand up right now. This is Josh Kurtz. Uh, he is with Maryland Matters. Hi, Josh. Do you have any questions for Ms. Lavoy? Uh, I don't. I don't know. Is there, will there be an appropriate time to ask uh, Mr. Mellon questions. questions on other topics? Oh, yeah, yeah. After the, the remainder of the presentation. Okay. Yes, absolutely. I'm sure. Sorry about that. <laughs> no worries. Thank you. Well, Ms. Lavoy, you can remain on the call on the event or you can jump off if you need to go. And once again, thank you so much for joining us today and, of course, for your service. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Right, now, moving, now, moving on um, next week uh, with the county executive back in town, we will continue our community conversations about the fiscal year 2025 budget. Um, remember, the county executive will be submitting the budget on March 15th. Um, that would go into effect on July 1st. He wants to hear from members of the community about the budget. Um, we will be having um, next week a uh, a forum in Silver Spring at the Civic Center at 7 to 8.30 p.m. And then on Wednesday at the White Oak Community Rec Center from 7 to 8.30 p.m. So if you're interested, please come out, um, hear the presentation, and um, provide your feedback to the, to the county executive. Um, lots of information about our budget, the current budget, um, the presentations that we've been giving are all available at the county's website. Now we're going to move on to um, our uh, weekly health report. And don't worry, Josh, I'll take questions um, at the end. Uh, there was a slight decline in the COVID case rate um, this past week. Uh, hospitalization data shows fewer patients in Montgomery County, but an increase in our ICU bed utilization. Not necessarily anyone, as Sean will say over and over, just um, you may have COVID, but that may not be the reason why you are in the hospital. So um, this is the number of people who are who are in the hospital who are COVID positive. Um, unfortunately, after nearly two months, the COVID vaccine rate for the new um, booster 
is only around 9% of the total population. So can't say it enough. You should get your COVID booster shot. You should get your flu shot. You should get your RSV shot. Um, especially if you're in high risk, you can make appointments through vaccines.gov. Please help protect your friends, your family, your neighbors before especially any travel around the holidays and get vaccinated. Now we're going to move on to um, not only Sean O'Donnell, the Acting Deputy Chief of Public Health, for his health report, but we're, um, we also have Dr. James Bridgers, our, Secretary, our Director of the Department of Health and Human Services, who himself is a veteran. So we not only want to recognize um, Dr. Bridgers for his many contributions to the Montgomery County government, but also thank Dr. Bridgers for his service um, to our country and his continued service to the people of our community. So with that, Sean. Thank you, Mr. Madalino. So I'll, I'll briefly go over just some of the surveillance that we're seeing uh, with related to our, our respiratory uh, disease threats. Um, uh, as was shared with you, our, our test positivity after coming down for a bit has kind of leveled off um, uh, both across the state and in Montgomery County. Our, uh, our testing, um, which gives transmissions uh, um, uh, apart from just hospitalizations, um, we've seen that, uh, again, sort of level off after coming down for a while um, uh, into a, a lower level than we've seen in the past. But uh, to be honest, I think most of our community is using rapid test kits, which are not um, um, submitted to the, the state or reported by the state. Uh, when we look at COVID on the left, influenza in the middle, and RSV on the right, this is moderate disease levels um, uh, as uh, shown from outpatient emergency department visits and some urgent care centers that provide data. You can see we have been coming down for COVID for a while, and then we have hit a little bump where we've leveled off. Influenza is just starting to tick up, and RSV um, has been uh, at a heightened level. This is largely with uh, younger individuals. You can see the those those x axes are a bit different for each one um you know so the don't don't compare those volumes uh, across the board but that's where we're seeing some activity happen with respiratory diseases um our our hospital counts in Montgomery County have held steady as you can see a little up and down um day to day but but relatively steady with uh patients that have a covid diagnosis and, and again may not be there specifically because of covid but there's lots of transmission still happening uh, across the state, um, it's been fairly uh, fairly level amounts of COVID uh, hospitalizations, both um, at the uh, acute care and, and very limited number of ICU patients, which is a good sign. Looking across the United States, uh, again, this is moderate illness. Uh, these are emergency department visits uh, as a percentage of emergency department visits. So. Uh, assuming that most other ED visits hold fairly steady, um, you can see where across the United States, uh, COVID has been coming down, RSV is going up, and influenza is just starting to go up. And uh, we're showing you here the different age groups. As you can see with RSV, it is largely affecting the, the ED visits are largely parents bringing their um, very young children there um, as they, they are uh, becoming ill to RSV because they don't yet have immunity to that disease. And most of them, it's, it's, uh, it tends to be fairly mild. But again, um, if you have a, a child who's under one years old, um, especially if they have any underlying um, respiratory conditions or if they were born prematurely, please consult with your doctor if, if they are ill. Um, for more severe illness hospitalizations, you can see uh, those numbers, again, are much uh, lower um, and have been coming down for COVID. Uh, you know, just to, to share with you, the, these peaks that we saw in the previous one for outpatient visits, similar during this last wave to the last winter wave, showing lots of transmissions going on, but, but you can see the, the peaks here for COVID much lower uh, compared to last winter. So not as much severe illness causing in patients. Um, and then where we are with influenza, this is the year-to-year -year chart where that dotted line is, is where we are. Um, the dark orange that is this year's, you can see it has not gone up considerably. 
that light orange that's above it, that was last year's very early and very large um, um, influenza spike. And the, the blue was prior to COVID, the 2019, which was a fairly large influenza year. So we're hoping it'll, it will be more mild, but we're still at the early point. Um, now is a great time if you haven't gotten the flu shot or your updated COVID booster to, to get them as our chief administrative officer has all suggested. Um, again, lots of places you can go to get resources for from testing to vaccinations. Um, so we encourage people to go out and do that. Uh, at this time, I'd like to um, turn it over to our director to see if Dr. Bridgers has anything he would like to add. Good afternoon, and thank you, Mr. O'Donnell, and thank you, Mr. Madalino, for recognizing all of the veterans this afternoon who continue to serve not only this country, but this county. I am equally pleased to serve or have had the opportunity to serve in both um, instances. And as a director of the Department of Health and Human Services, it is our vision to help not only the residents and their families, but also residents who have veterans as their family members. It is a holistic approach and we have a great uh, Commission on Veterans Affairs where we have a, um, list of uh, opportunities and services supporting our LGBTQ plus veterans with resources, benefits, enrollment, um, family support services, intimate partner, violence, counseling, um, um, housing assistance. And so those are just a few of those network services that we provide, but it is all about the journey and supporting the journey of our service members from their time of enlistment to deployment and post-deployment. And we look uh, forward to continuing along this effort. We have great services in the county. So I welcome all of the veterans who are in the county who may be listening this afternoon to contact our Commission on Veteran um, Affairs at 240-184-865 uh, or um, visit our website at the county with our Department of Health and Human Services. We have a lot of services that are beneficial and support our veteran community. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Berger. Thank Bridgers. you, Dr. Berger. I think people can also call 311, and you, the, when you gave the number, it was a little jarbled if you want to give that number again. You need to unmute, Dr. Bridgers. Can you please unmute, Dr. That Bridgers? That number is 240. Can you hear me, Lorna? Yes. That yes. number is 240-418-4865. And as we say in the military, I say again, 240-418-4865. Thank you, Dr. Bridgers and Mr. O'Donnell. Uh, members of the media, this is the Q&A portion of this uh, media briefing. Any questions regarding different topics and or public health? Please raise your hand. Uh, Josh, <laughs> there you are. Go ahead, your question. Thank you, thank you so much. I'm sorry to bust in. I, I, I just have to say, I know Josh Kurtz and you are not Josh Kurtz. <laughs> uh, not sure, I, I don't even know how to answer that. I, yeah. I'm gonna pause. The, the, the Maryland yeah, Department yeah, of yeah. The other guy, the other. yeah, he. I got here first. Anyway, um, I, I, I hate to raise this topic with the county executive gone, but um, there, but but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, there has been some criticism of the group Casa by members of the county council and some members of the county's legislative delegation, and I for their, I guess, tweets that were sort of expressing support for. Palestine. I, I wondered if the administration has taken any view on this, whether there might be any um, risk to some of the government funding the organization takes place, or have there been sort of any conversations about this controversy at all within the administration? Well, um, we haven't had specific conversations with the county executive because he is almost 12 hours right. exactly opposite. So, exactly. Um, you know, the, the county executive, the county government remains focused on making sure um, everyone here is safe and secure. You know, um, hopefully, you know, we put out uh, more than $300,000 worth of grants to 
Jewish organizations, Muslim organizations, other religious organizations to try to make sure um, everyone, every facility, the people going to those facilities remain safe and secure. So job number one um, in this conflict for the county executive is how do we make sure everyone is safe and secure here? And that's where we continue to be to be focused. Um, you know, CASA, uh, I, I think, issued a, a clear apology for, for what they said. Um, and uh, I'll wait for the county executive to respond when he gets back. But certainly CASA has been a longtime valued partner with the county government, um, with so many other nonprofit organizations uh, and for-profit organizations uh, across the county and this entire region in delivering services to immigrants of all types. And um, we continue to look forward to work with CASA as that valued partner. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Members of the media, any more questions? Marianne Shahzad, Montgomery Community Media. Go ahead, Marianne, good afternoon. Good afternoon, thank you. Uh, I think uh, Mr. Madalino mentioned a lower vaccination rate for this new booster currently. Could uh, Mr. O'Donnell talk about that a little more? Sure. Um, we've we've shared some of the vaccination rates uh, in the past. I, I, the our state partners, Maryland Department of Health, does publish the uh, the influenza vaccination rates uh, as of um, a, as of this past week uh, for influenza. Our county is at twenty one point two percent vaccinated, uh, which is a little under half of where we ended up last year. There's still many months that people will come out to get vaccinations. So, uh, and what we what we have uh, projected in the past was because influenza um, vaccinations were available about a month or so before uh, COVID vaccinations, because there is a, uh, a, a better historic system to get out influenza vaccines, um, uh, through the private sector, um, that that uptake was going to be a bit higher. So we we worked with our epidemiology team to look at our COVID vaccinations to see where we were now, and um, and what we where we were was uh, approximately between eight and nine percent uh, vaccinated. This was as of about a week ago, um, but the the COVID vaccinations are moving a bit slower. They do look like the the Previous year's booster campaign, where the the vaccination rates were uh, were lower than the initial vaccination rates in our county. Um, when we looked at last year's COVID vaccinations in Montgomery County, um, they were significantly lower than the initial two doses. They were still about uh, about double the national rates at all age groups. Um, so I don't yet have uh, vaccination rates for the rest of the the country. Um, we we have heard and we we, we have experienced uh, amongst our our team the challenges with getting a, a COVID vaccination now um, from insurance companies who have been less than forthright with private providers about how they will reimburse those shots uh, with people uh, trying to determine where they can go so that their insurance covers the shots um, and with making appointments so it's been a, a little bit more challenging to get those shots. Um, and, you know, again, I commend our, our federal partners for instituting a program that can provide free vaccinations to our uninsured and underinsured populations so that that does not hold back. But it has been, um, uh, you know, with the cost of the vaccine, I know some providers have said to, to individuals, um, you know, we might need you to pay up front until we get the insurance to clarify how they'll reimburse. Now, I'm hoping at this point, most of that has been worked out. Um, we, again, encourage people to uh, to contact their providers, contact pharmacies. Usually a pharmacy can tell you if your insurance will uh, cover it. Um, sometimes you have to go to a specific pharmacy and it's that's just the, the, the nature of where our healthcare um, and insurance system is now. Thank you. Thank you, Moran and uh, Mr. O'Donnell. Members of the media, any more questions, please raise your hand. No more questions? CEO Madalino, would you like to close this uh, media briefing? Um, thank you, Lorna. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Just want to remind everyone again, 
um, take a moment um, this Saturday to thank a veteran. Thank you, Dr. Bridgers um, and other people for um, their, their service. Uh, remind, I'd like to remind people that because of the Veterans Day holiday following on a Saturday, that the county government will be closed on Friday. Um, Veterans Day remains a holiday for the Montgomery County government. So um, we will um, be um, uh, taking that day to honor our veterans. And then of course, the Thanksgiving Day Parade next Saturday, uh, November, excuse me, November 18th in Silver Spring. Um, so lots of really good things happening in our community. Come out um, and learn about our budget and make your suggestions to the county executive on Monday evening in Silver Spring, Wednesday evening in um, White Oak. Next Wednesday evening in White Oak. Thank you, Mr. Madalino. Thank you everybody for joining us. Um, no more questions, so stay safe and uh, we'll see you next time. Have a great afternoon, everybody recommendations based on the current building code. Older decks may not meet today's stricter building code standards. One example is picket spacing. Current code allows a four inch gap between pickets. Most deck collapses are caused by a failure at the ledger. That's at the connection to the house. We always check the ledger attachment method. Is the ledger flashed? Is it bolted? Is it connected with ledger lock?